archaeological observations of environmental injustice from an excavation of a 19th century company town. Soon it expanded to looking at the historic removal of indigenous populations from their expansive traditional homelands to vastly different, more urbanized settings. And now in its most recent iteration, this paper has become a rather scattered manifesto, maybe, for an archaeology of environmental injustice that attempts to relate human environmental interactions to biopower. Foucault describes biopower as a set of mechanisms through which the basic biological features of the human species become the object of political strategy. The relationships between biopower and processes of capitalism and industrialization have come under increasing scrutiny by activists in the environmental justice movement. Ethnographic studies in modern industrialized setting, uh, societies demonstrate marked environmental discrimination, particularly against racialized groups and working class communities. This has occurred in both rural and urban contexts, as well as landscapes that transition from rural to urban and vice versa. And environmental injustice has often accompanied those, trans those transitions. These discriminatory practices have resulted in the disempowerment of marginalized, marginalized populations, loss of land, contamination of natural resources, and sickening of human populations. While environmental injustices have been explored through sociological and ethnographic research in recent times and through historical anthropology, few archaeological studies have addressed this type of discrimination explicitly. Here I begin with an introduction to the topic of environmental injustice, followed by two case studies to illustrate related themes, and conclude with a working outline of the theories and methods proposed for an archaeology of environmental injustice. I use this term to, enco to encompass a variety of discriminatory environmental practices that disproportionately affect the health and well-being of certain populations, especially minorities, immigrants, women and children, and the working classes. And thus I use it to uh, include environmental racism, classism, sexism, and the like. The concept has its roots in terminology from environmental justice literature, for example, that identifies environmental injustice as when a particular social group is burdened with environmental hazards and describes environmental inequality as the intersection of environmental quality and social hierarchies. In other words, social inequalities are institutionalized and governmentalized, to use another of Foucault's terms, in corporate policies and political legislation, which places certain populations at increased risk from pollution, poor sanitation, hazards in the built environment, and the effects of population displacement, among others. Such practices involve biopower, where human bodies become subjects of political and economic maneuvering, as discussed above. Historically, as in the present, discriminatory policies were not often part of the public transcript, and thus cannot be found in documents or must be inferred from them. As archaeologists, we're well positioned to find the material remains of environmental injustice that might not be visible uh, otherwise, and to illuminate the historical roots of modern injustices. The idea that uh, archaeology should be attuned to modern political conflict and social justice is not a new one. A number of archaeologists have developed a rich trajectory of political and emancipatory archaeologies. And an archaeology of environmental discrimination fits comfortably within that literature. It's also related to what Don Hardesty described as global change archaeology, which seeks to document and apply historical knowledge of past human environmental interactions to the understanding of contemporary problems and the management and planning for future sustainability. Critiques of social injustices around environmental issues are implicit in many researchers' work, even if they do not explicitly frame them as biopolitical discrimination against a particular population. For example, almost any archaeological study of historic indigenous populations probably documents the displacement of native people from their traditional homelands and the resulting interplay of human geography, environmental conditions, <coughs> access to natural resources, and human mental and physical health. The same can be said for other racialized groups, such as enslaved Africans and their descendants, who were often subjected to harsher living conditions than their white counterparts. Projects addressing immigrant and working class populations also illustrate environmental discrimination. The archaeology of the Colorado Coalfield War clearly addresses the effects of biopower on the bodies of striking miners and their families as they endured harsh conditions in temporary tent colonies. Stacy Camp's book, The Archaeology of Citizenship, demonstrates how one American company quietly placed Mexican immigrants 
immigrant laborers into dangerous and unsanitary living conditions, but publicly blamed their personal hygiene for spread of disease. Archaeology at company towns like Fayette, Michigan can also provide very clear examples of environmental discrimination. Fayette was a town entirely built and operated by the Jackson Iron Company from 1867 to 1891 to support iron smelting. Employees and their families rented houses from the company in one of three neighborhoods loosely divided by economic class and employees' occupations. An upper-class neighborhood occupied by the superintendent and the doctor, a middle-class neighborhood predominated by skilled tradesmen, and a working-class neighborhood occupied mostly by laboring immigrants and their families. Their working-class residents who were mostly foreign-born experienced environmental discrimination in the form of an industrial waste dump known as Slag Beach, <coughs> which was located adjacent to and within their neighborhood. Excavations in the working-class neighborhood revealed thick, a thick deposit of slag and charcoal mixed with large quantities of household refuse. Earlier excavations of working-class houses there showed that families there may have made the best of it by heaping the industrial waste up against the footings of their log cabins as extra insulation, insulation from the harsh winters. During our later excavations there and in the other two neighborhoods, we began to realize that the middle and upper-class neighborhoods had much, much cleaner yards although we did not attempt to quantify such observations. <coughs> Access to sanitation was also very different between neighborhoods as well. The upper and middle class neighborhoods had deep privies excavated into bedrock. In contrast, we could not find privies in the working class neighborhood even in two seasons of excavation. It's possible we were just unlucky or they had some other method. But it's even more likely that privies there would necessarily have been very shallow due to the neighborhood situation on a bed of beach cobbles and very close to the water table. They might not have had privies at all and just dumped timber pots into the lake, which was right out their front door. In any scenario, it's likely that human waste regularly mixed with yard refuse and potentially their water supply. Other environmental differences became clear with the use of ArcGIS. U-Shed analysis showed that the upper classes in particular had magnificent views of the town site, while the laborers' view was mostly of their own extremely crowded neighborhood. Most working class cabins were placed roughly 10 feet apart. There were also substantial differences in the size of household yards and, and neighbors' access to recreation, neighborhoods' access to recreation and green spaces. The upper class housing was surrounded by large wooded areas, as well as roads and trails that functioned as promenades. In contrast, the working class houses, uh, housing was tightly packed between the steep bluff and the lake and adjacent to Slag Beach and the train tracks. Their route to work to the furnace took them past the jail every day uh, as subjects of symbolic violence. A second case study illustrates a different kind of environmental injustice. The Stewart Indian School in Carson City, Nevada dates to 1890 and operated until 1980. Uh, it was the subject of an archaeological field school in collaboration with the University of Nevada, Reno, the Washoe Tribe, and the Nevada Indian Commission. Like other similar schools in the U.S., it was mandated in 1890 by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and established through federal policies designed to force assimilation. Some biopolitical goals were made visible in forcing boys to cut their hair short and subjecting children to Western health and hygiene <coughs> procedures. Archaeological evidence for this elaborates the documentary and oral histories, uh, including uh, things like lice cones and medicine vials and army buttons. In the early years, children were required to march in lines and wear military uniforms. This bodily discipline is further evidence in embossed uh, buttons excavated from Stuart. Other biopolitical goals were less visible. The federal government recognized some of the implications of removing children from their homelands. The removal was not just a physical one, but also a process that removed them from their tribe's political economies and placed them into the American capitalist economy, teaching them to be both producers and consumers. The removal of children from their homelands had widespread repercussions that created disconnects between the landscape and the cultural and spiritual knowledge embedded within specific places a process famously articulated in Keith Basso's book, Wisdom Sits in Places. 
To lose access to their homelands was to lose access to cultural memories and prescriptive ethical stories from the ancestors that give guidance to future generations. The removal of children from their homelands to this school has parallels to the removal of artifacts from sites during archaeological projects. This collaborative project inspired important conversations about the implications of removing artifacts from archaeological sites, which had surprising insights for me, to understand the connection between moving people and moving artifacts around the landscape. This is in contrast to how uh, the federal legislation is written, which of course encourages uh, the archaeological conservation of materials for future study um, and allows and encourages the, the scientific removal of these artifacts from one place to be curated elsewhere. In contrast to this, uh, one of our research partners from the Washoe tribe explained the importance of leaving certain kinds of artifacts in place. He said, if all the artifacts are removed from the landscape, then we have nothing to show that we were ever there. This is why it's so important to leave archaeological materials, lithics, etc., in place. It is our story, and we want to maintain that connection to the landscape. No one should have the right to erase history by the removal of material evidence. His comments reflect knowledge and values that are not present in the governmentalized discourse of legislation. For instance, many American Indian tribes respect power that is tied to specific places and objects, power that should not be casually disrupted. As an example, among numic speaking tribes, this power is known as Puha, which according to cultural anthropologist Alice, Alex Carol Luska and her colleagues, pervades all manifestations of the visible world and concentrates in certain people, places, and objects to higher degrees than others. Intentional disposal of objects on the landscape is sometimes an effort to both harness the power of that place and lend power to that place. Citing work by Jay Miller, they further describe Puha as a cosmic force that, together with the life force, forms the fabric of the universe. It constantly flows through a web-like structure that connects all things and beings, humans or otherwise, that make up the universe. As such, ordinary, ordinary places become charged with repeated use. Prayers, depositing artifacts, storytelling, linguistic in inscription, and memory anchoring. So in essence, an archaeological project that disturbs the earth may adhere to federal and state regulations, but still risk disrupting the very fabric of the universe. A quick story from the Stuart Indian School project illustrates this possibility to some of us. On the day we first broke ground on the excavation, Mark, the eldest member of our crew, who's an archaeologist and also a member of the Washoe tribe, gave a prayer and led us in smudging with burning sage. He explained the seriousness of what we were about to do, disturbing the earth, placing thing, displacing things from where our ancestors had left them, literally breaking through time. Mark's opening prayer and our ground disturbance at once converged with this place's dark past, its contested present and uncertain future. The next day, when we arrived at the site, we found the largest owl I had ever seen, and it had died of unknown causes. Owls are often considered messengers, sometimes about issues surrounding death. We learned later that day that Mark had had a stroke and was recovering in a nearby hospital. I don't know if these remarkable events are connected, but it was a startling experience for all of us, to say the least, uh, to consider that the movement of artifacts could affect the lives of people today. I'm grateful that Mark and other participants will be contributing authors for a multivocal edited volume to explore these complex ideas and their implications for archaeological practice. Case studies like Fayette and Stewart Indian School hint at the rich data we have to analyze historic incidents of environmental discrimination if we consciously choose to explore it as a research agenda. Developing theory and method for uh, such a trajectory will help guide research to come. In terms of theoretical approaches that could be applied here, Foucault's work on biopower, the privilege of hygiene, and governmentality is obviously applicable. Similarly, Marxist and neo-Marxist theory regarding class relations has already been applied extensively in archaeology of capitalism and can be extended with a more explicit focus on class and the environment, as in doing comparative studies between class-based neighborhoods or studying the health effects of dangerous work environments. 
Scholars in the environmental justice movement provide a number of related frameworks for conceptualizing and modeling this type of inequality. For example, sociologist David Pellow advocates for the study of agency, particularly in regard to problematizing researchers' tendency to present the target of the target populations and environmental inequality as simply passive, reactive, or invisible. Instead, he proposes a life cycle analysis that includes not just industrial waste disposal, for example, but considers the entire process of resource extraction, commodity production, distribution, consumption, and disposal. Something more complex than the so-called end of the pipe approach often found in the literature. The end of the pipe at Fayette was Flag Beach, and for many Native children, it was Stewart Indian School. But these were driven by larger processes of capitalism in which people from many parts of society actively participated. Also from sociology, ecofeminism and black feminist theory bring much needed attention to the effects of power, not only on minorities, but also women and children. Their emphasis on intersectional identities and socially lived knowledge illustrate how scientific discourses have been used to justify discriminatory practices against women and people of color, and that historically they were often leaders in the environmental movement. In our case studies, we might seek out evidence of women's contributions to the environmental movement and healthcare at our sites, since female employees, wives, and mothers, as well as children, were often at the forefront and home front of these lived experiences of poverty, dangerous environments, and poor access to sanitation. From our own field of archaeology, we can draw upon approaches in the archaeology of global climate change such as those posited by Mark Hudson and his colleagues, which examines social justice and environmental sustainability within a Brazilian framework. Thus, the new face of ecological archaeology can provide key ideas for studying environmental injustice from a more holistic approach to human environment interactions. Similarly, Don Harvesty's Global Change Archaeology offers theoretical insights into the relationship between environmental archaeology, applied anthropology, agency, and praxis. As for methodological approaches, the basic starting point is to ask, how can we recognize archaeologically when environmental practice has become institutionalized so that it disproportionately affects a certain usually marginalized group? As one example, we can study loss of land, for instance, by Native American populations, because it had far-reaching and complicated results for human environmental interactions. As a methodological starting point, GIS can help illustrate land loss and population movement around known archaeological sites and from there, we can begin to extrapolate um, from remains of foodways, healthcare, and sanitation, as well as health consequences and environmental alterations that accompany these sleeping changes. Sanitation is another area of research where archaeologists have already made headway. Uh, as discussed previously, archaeology's standard methods in studying historic sanitation have already been applied to show that marginalized groups often had less access to sanitation than their more privileged counterparts. Have to be faster. Studying the incidence of pollution at historic sites also has tremendous potential to uh, il il illuminate past environmental injustice. When excavating the three neighborhoods at Fayette, we did not include systematic sampling procedures that would compare incidents of industrial waste in domestic contexts, but it simply did not occur to us this might be useful to quantify. But it would be enlightening to do so. Archaeologists working at similar sites could sample yard debris to compare the amounts of slag found in each neighborhood or conduct uh, X-ray fluorescence analysis of sediments to check for toxic elements such as mercury and uranium, which could be especially common in mining and ore processing communities. We would then have concrete data on which, uh, which groups were exposed more than others. Environmentalist Michael Golobter discusses three clusters of variables that can measure current environmental discrimination. An archaeologist could conceivably identify these in the material record. Uh, regarding exposure to pollutants, he suggests we examine these factors as factors such as proximity to pollutant sources, as we did at Slag Beach, and whether all members of the community were equally protected from pollutants by corporate or government policies. The Lopter also points out the discriminatory practices often found in people's view sheds and proximity to open space, recreation, and nature. Again, spatial evidence for this is quite clear at Fayette and probably elsewhere if we choose to examine and frame it as such. A third group of very telling variables is related to health impacts on different groups that could be related to environmental conditions. 
At historic sites, we look for evidence of health impacts from working and living in polluted environmental and environmental neighborhoods with poor sanitation. This might come in the form of medical paraphernalia, evidence of human parasites, and historic documents. The thoughts presented here are just a few opening ideas to work toward an archaeology of environmental discrimination. We are poised to examine these issues at a wide variety of locations, including indigenous sites, sites of enslavement, industrial communities, or any urbanized setting, and spaces in between. Much of the data needed to examine these questions is already at our fingertips should we choose to frame it as such. In the bigger picture, this is another of many ways that historical archaeology can contribute to the understandings of the modern world, particularly by examining environmental discrimination in historical and ideological contexts and asking how much these practices have persisted into the present. Thank you.